Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. Today we're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance for one of their celebrity lectures. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. There are many components to the wonderful legacy of William Wellman. Aviator, pioneer, war hero, and movie pioneer, but probably the greatest components of that wonderful legacy that we can still have the privilege of enjoying is his son, William Wellman Jr., an accomplished and acclaimed movie pioneer in his own right, who has consented to share some of that legacy with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, William Wellman Jr. Now, what I'd like to do is, uh, is open it up to questions and answers because, I mean, I can talk about my father for weeks, but I'd rather talk about the things that you all are most interested in hearing about. So if there are any questions, uh, you know, raise your hand and, and we'll, we'll, we'll do some uh, Q&A. Gentleman there on the end. Uh, how many pilots lost their lives during the filming of Wings. Uh, the gentleman's name was Charles Wisely, and uh, he was an Air Force pilot, and he lost control of his plane and crashed, and that was the only, um, that was the only death, uh, it, as amazing as it is, because when you see all of the, the stunts and the dogfights and everything that's in that film, and, and, and by the way, uh, for for some of you that maybe don't realize it, those those planes were they're kites, really. They're wood and baling wire and canvas. Uh, when they tried to figure out how to film uh, during Wings, I forgot this part. Sure, when they tried to figure out where do we put the camera, how are we going to film the actors in the air, and at first they would have a camera plane and they would have a picture plane. But of course there was a stunt pilot because they had, my father hadn't gotten the idea yet that the actors were gonna be taking flying lessons. So here's the, here's the picture plane and here's the camera plane with two cockpits, pilot in the first cockpit and a cameraman in the second cockpit. Now the cameraman in, those, in that era preferred having a hand cranked camera. There was a motorized camera but there, and a hand cranked. They liked the hand cranked because they could control the action of a scene, make it a little faster, a little slower. So here comes the camera plane alongside the picture plane. And in the second seat is the cameraman with his camera on a tripod trying to hand crank it. Now, and those planes, if you think they're going like this, they're not, they're going like this, the wind is just, they're shuddering with the wind. So it was unwatchable. So that's when my father and, and his cameraman decided that we're gonna have to find a way to bolt the cameras to the fuselages of the planes. So at least it would steady, steady it down. But there was only, there was only the one fatality. And of course, at that point, the, the, Air, the Army Air Force as it was at that time, said, if there's one more fatality, now there were a number of planes that had crashed, uh, Army Air Force planes, and they said if there's one more fatality or one more plane crash, you know, because the planes were worth about six, seven thousand dollars, we're taking our troops and our planes out of there. I had six siblings, all by my mother, by my father's fifth wife, and we, we heard this stuff about Wild Bill and we'd meet people at times that would talk about Wild Bill and everything. But we, what we saw was, my father was tough. I mean, he was a taskmaster, but he was fair. We, we knew the rules. There was no gray. It was black or white. There was no, uh, well, today it's this way, tomorrow it's different. Never, never happened. My father set the rules. And, you know, and if you ever went against mother, anything mother wanted us to do, whoa, you were in trouble. So, I mean, I had some hairbrushes 
broken over my, my rear end. This is not politically correct to say this kind of thing anymore, but my father never beat us or anything like that. But he, in, in the book of Perfect Fathers, there would not be a chapter for my father, but he was the best father that I could ever imagine because we knew he cared about us. He was always supporting us. Um, he was, I think, fabulous father. How many of my siblings became pilots? And my oldest sister, Pat, she became, in fact, there's a gentleman here today who was a, a pilot for TWA, and he dated my, my sister, Pat, when she was an airline stewardess. And she also soloed herself. Um, none of us did. I always cared about planes. As a, as a kid, I always made model planes. I always, but I never really cared about piloting a plane. Um, I, I love World War II planes. I love going to air shows. I go to an air show that you, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm the guy having the most fun that's there. Not some 12-year-old kid, me. I'm loving it. I had a fabulous experience, and this is aviation, so I, I can tell this story. In 1996, I believe, the Palm Springs Air Museum opened. I'm sure some of you have been there. And they had this big gala black tie affair on a Saturday night. And Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, the museum opened and uh, the public was allowed to, to come. And so this is quite some time ago, 1996. So I'm, I'm 78 now, so, you know, I'm in my 60s or whatever. And they had a lot of veteran pilots from World War II. And they went to great lengths to find them and to bring them in to be, you know, part of this, this gala. So they had two big hangers. And one hanger was for the cocktail party. And they had the Navy planes. They had a, they had a Tomcat. They had a, an, a Hellcat. Uh, and they had uh, bars around the planes, you know, and, and people in service uniform of the period would be passing hors d'oeuvres. Uh, it was really terrific. And I, the joke got to be, because people looked at me and I was the youngest, you know, and a lot of these veteran pilots would come over and say, what did you fly? I said, well, I don't fly anything, but my father flew uh, Newports and Spads in World War I. So that got to be a joke. That got around. Then when they finished the cocktail period and everybody went to the other hangar that was set up for a beautiful uh, dinner with a stage and, oh, the decorations were just fantastic. And they had Les Brown and his band of renown and other entertainers. And the first entertainer was Howard Keel, the great musical star of MGM of the 1950s with that beautiful baritone voice. And all of the ex-pilots, they all sit down, you know, we're all there. And Howard Keel got up there and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, it's, it's absolutely a pleasure for me to be here, but I have to tell you that I, I'm not as young as I used to be and I just learned this song. So if I miss a few of the words, forgive me. So he motioned for Les Brown to pipe up the band and he stood up there and he goes, off we go into the wide blue yonder. He sang the whole anthem. And I mean, there was not a dry eye in that place when he finished. And now the next day at 10 in the morning, all the planes, and they had gathered some 25 planes, Navy planes, Air Force planes. They had B, a B-17. They had a B-25. They had... Uh, a P-40 Warhawk, they had a P-51, they had a British Spitfire, they had a Tomcat, they had a Thunderbolt. I mean, they had all these great planes. And to listen to them all warm up and get ready to take off and fly around Palm Springs was fantastic. And I'll never, ever forget the B-17, when, when he took off, and he made a big circle around Palm Springs, and he came back, and he came in low, right down close to the airfield. And on the right side was a Mustang, 
and on the left wing was a Spitfire, and they were doing barrel rolls as they came through. I, I get goose flesh just t thinking about that. That was absolutely fantastic. My father loved pilots. Of all the great stars that he directed, he directed presidents. He directed a film with uh, Dwight Eisenhower. I mean, the people that meant the most were pilots. It all went back to World War I because he lost all but two of his friends in that war. And one of them was missing in action for uh, six months after the war. And he never lost sight of that, the camaraderie that he had with those young pilots. And if you, any of his movies, you'll see that, that feeling, that camaraderie, that caring, that the, the triumph and the tragedies that came to him during his war years. It's there in all his movies. Uh, question is, do I have a list of my father's movies? Yes. In the book that I brought, I have a complete filmography uh, of all his films. And um, one of the things that I think he never, he always got credit for some few films, like Wings, like Battleground, and uh, Star is Born, and The Oxbow Incident, some few films. But when you look at his whole resume, he did every kind of film. He did comedies, he did dramas, he did kid pictures. Uh, he did gangster pictures. I mean, Public Enemy, one of the all-time greats. Um, it's just amazing that he was so adept at any kind of film. That's why that even though he, could, he would cause trouble at the studios, of course, if you left him alone, he didn't cause any trouble, but the, the moguls that ran all the studios, they knew that he could direct any kind of film. And he did a lot of films, maybe somewhere around 12, 15, 20 films that he worked on uncredited, films that got into trouble and they didn't know what to do with it. And my father would get in there and work it out. Um, he was absolutely fantastic at that. I think only Howard Hawks would be on the same level with my father in terms of the variety of, of films that he made. Even John, you know, if, if Alfred Hitchcock made a film, if Frank Capra made a film, if John Ford made a film for the most part, you knew what you were going to see. But when a William Wellman film came out, you had no idea. It could be anything, any kind of film. Couldn't pigeonhole him into one type, one genre. He could do anything. What was the one trait that made him so successful? It's hard to say one, one thing because he was such a vital, he had such energy. You know, he, you couldn't keep up. Somebody once said that he sprinted through life. See, and I think that's true. He never thought about yesterday. You know, he was always looking forward. And the reason that he could go from, make transitions from silent films to talking films to color. He directed the first color drama and the first color comedy, Stars Born and Nothing Sacred. Wide screen. He was able to transition and make successful films in every decade that he worked. Um, he just, first of all, he was a great athlete as a kid. And he used to, when he was on location on his pictures, he would always have, he would always say, who wants to race me? Anybody in the crew, the cast, you know, he was always doing that. Nobody could beat him. And that was kind of how his life was. You know, he was always on the move. He, he never felt sorry for himself, you know. He's the kind of a person, sounds silly, you could put him in a room with no doors or windows, he'd find something to do, you know? Yes, back there. How was his, how was his golf game? Well, 
When he was under contract at Warner's in the 30s, his brother, and he and his brother always had a big competition against each other. And his brother had been playing golf for years and he challenged my father to a game of golf, $100 Nassau, for those of you that, that know golf. $100 for the front nine, $100 for the back nine, $100 for the, the combination. Well, Bobby Jones, the famous, the best golfer of the era, was making shorts at Warner Brothers at the time. So my father went to Bobby Jones and said, my brother's going to come out. He's challenged me to a game of golf, and I don't know how to play. I never played. <laughs> and Bobby Jones says, OK, are you really serious? And my father said, oh, yeah, I'll do whatever you say. So Bobby Jones set up lessons across the street from Warner Brothers is Lakeside Country Club. Harry Bassler was the pro back in the 30s. And Harry Bassler and Bobby Jones were friends. And Bobby Jones didn't have time to be with my father all the time. So he had Harry Bassler give my father lessons. And my father took lessons every day, worked really, just worked as hard as you could work on something. So when my brother finally came out, um, my father won, he, he, he won all the money. I think he broke, I think he broke 80 for the first time when his brother came out. And my father became a two handicap player at Lakeside. Of course, he didn't make money with the, with the bets. He won all the bets, but by the time he, you, you figure that he had joined the, the country club and he had to buy clubs and clothes and, you know, the whole routine. So it, it was a losing proposition financially, but he beat his brother. That's all he cared about. And then uh, in 1938, he joined Bel Air Country Club. He, he bought a home. My father was one of the first film people to buy a home and live in Brentwood in West Los Angeles. Because you see, originally, everyone in the film industry wanted to live around the studios in Hollywood and even Pasadena and part of Beverly Hills. Uh, uh, but after a while, they thought, we want to work at the studios, but we want to have more privacy. We don't want to stay, stay around here. So my father moved out to uh, Brentwood uh, we had, he had some aerial shots taken, and there's like nine homes in an area of, let's say, one, two, three, four, four parallel streets, and then maybe six blocks uh, north and south. Not that big an area, and there's like 11 homes there. And my father was, all, was right in there, and it became, it was interesting growing up in this community because all of a sudden all the film people started arriving. Now, on, on, on those streets that I told you about, one, two, three, four streets, and north of Sunset, about six blocks, there was something like 27 celebrities. We had Tyrone Power, Gary Cooper, the Andrew sisters, John Payne, who was married to Gloria DeHaven, Jennifer Jones, married to Robert Walker, there was Lana Turner, there was Red Skelton, there was Peter Lawford, there was Bing Crosby's brother, Bob Crosby, there was Xavier Cugat, there was Irene Dunn, uh, Fred McMurray, Frank Capra, um, I thought everybody had these people in their neighborhoods. As a kid, I, you know, they were, oh, a hop along Cassidy, how could I forget that? Uh, I thought everybody had these people in their neighborhoods till I got to be maybe 12 or 13, and I thought, well, wait a minute. People said, Bill, they don't, they're not in everybody's neighborhood. I forgot, Henry Fonda and all the Fondas. My first girlfriend was Jane Fonda when I was eight. First girl I kissed was Jane Fonda. My father didn't keep secrets. He would talk about his ex-wives. He always said it was my fault, you know, but he would talk about anything. He never, 
it was the most amazing thing that if you asked him a question, he told you exact, without even taking a breath, he would tell you exactly what he thought at that moment. And a lot of times he said things that were not very political, you know, politically correct. And as far as what bad decisions that he made, I think the only one that he would really talk about was the last movie, his last film, which ended up being called the Lafayette Escadrille. And this was his 11th aviation film. And he wanted this to be his masterpiece. He had been trying to get this picture made for some almost 30 years. He, he tried it at Warner Brothers in the 30s. He tried it with David Selznick in the late 30s. Daryl Zanuck at 20th Century Fox in the 40s. Uh, L.B. Mayer and Dory Sherry in the 50s. And nobody wanted to do a World War I film anymore. And because of The High and the Mighty, it was such a phenomenal success. And Warner Brothers was distributing all of the John Wayne films, and they distributed High and the Mighty. And so Jack Warner, one of the last moguls still working, he, uh, he wanted my father at the studio. So my father talked him into letting him do this movie that my father called C'est la Guerre. It's the war. And my father had been writing this about all the young pilots that he had known, the members of the Lafayette Escadrille, uh, his first wife, who was French, and she was killed. She was blown up in a maternity hospital in Paris in the First World War. My, they had only been married a few months. Um, she was in it, Renee was her name. Uh, so Jack Warner said, okay, I'll let you do it, but you gotta do it, it's gotta be low budget. Um, you've got to, you know, you're gonna shoot a lot of it on a sound stage, you can't be out doing a lot of expensive aviation work and all this kind of thing, but my father was so happy to be able to get a chance to do it but he made some bad decisions. He wanted James Dean to play the lead. And the leading character is called Thad Walker. But the leading character, my father said it was based on one of his friends. And I think it is the high school buddy of his that, that they used to steal cars, you know, borrow cars together. And I think the half of it was my father. Even though my father has his own character in the movie, and I played it. So he wanted James Dean, who had been perfect. James Dean was killed. Then he wanted Paul Newman, who was a new contract player at Warner Brothers. So my father met with Paul Newman, and he thought, well, he used to make, my father would make kind of jokes. He said, Newman tried to tell me how to make my pic, how to direct my picture, but I, I like his maverick style. He, he's right for it. But Jack Warner says, you can't use him. He's, given us a, he's giving us a lot of trouble at the studio. He doesn't like the projects. Well, they gave him the first movie that Newman made was called The Silver Chalice, a, a cheapy sword and sandal movie, and Newman was furious about that. So Jack Warner said, I'm going to put him under suspension so you can't use him. I want you to use my young star, Tab Hunter. Now, to be fair, Tab Hunter was like the Tom Cruise of that era. Tab Hunter had all the teenage audience, just like Tom Cruise had later. Um, and my father was getting, my father was impatient. He couldn't wait. You know, you couldn't get him to wait. If, if, if somebody said, you have to delay the start date of the picture, he wouldn't do it. And in this case, he didn't want to delay anymore. So he had used Tab Hunter in a movie called Track of the Cat. And he thought he did a good job. So, and this, I think, was a mistake. 
that my father made. But it would have worked out. See, Tab Hunter was a major star at the time. But by the time the picture, they held the picture back because of problems of Tab Hunter became a singing star. He had the number one record, Young Love it was called. He had another record that was in the top 10. And Jack Warner didn't like the fact that he wasn't getting any money from the music end of the business. He had Hunter signed as an actor, but not, you know, so he finally found a way to get Tab Hunter out of his contract as a, as a singer and into a Warner Brothers contract, but he had to start a record company, Warner Brothers Records. So he kept the movie out of release while he set up the Warner Brothers Records. And the point I'm making is Tab Hunter's career kind of started to arc downward. Confidential came out and said that uh, he was gay. And in the 50s, nobody was gay. See, everybody was in the closet. So uh, this caused problems when that came out and it started to hurt Tab Hunter's career. So my father, you know, believed that he made a, mis made a mistake there. First of all, he never said it, but he should not have had me playing him. See, I mean, he's Wild Bill, I'm Mild Bill. <laughs> but the point is, I knew nothing about acting. I'm going to Duke University, I'm a freshman. I'm taking business administration. I mean, I used to go on all my set dad's sets and locations. I went on 23 of them. And if it was in the summer and I wasn't in school, I'd go for the whole shoot. I loved being around the movies. I, I thought it was fabulous, but I never thought about being in it in any way. So he hires me to play him. Now, I had to test in front of Jack Warner. I had to be passed by everyone at Warner Brothers Studio, including my father, before I got the job. And I was lucky that I tested with Tab Hunter. It was a live test in front of Jack Warner and all the big wigs at Warner Brothers. And also the prospective actors were sitting in chairs there at the same time. And I was nervous as hell. I mean, I, I felt like I had volcanic eruptions going, going on inside me. But the thing that was, Tab Hunter was nervous too. But his nervousness showed more than mine. So they thought I was okay, so I got the role. But the point is, I said to my dad, well, how do, I, how do I be an actor? And he says, you don't act, you be yourself. My first thought was, I want to be better than myself. I didn't know what to do. And as, as you, if you ever see the movie, I'm just kind of there. I'm okay, there's no acting going on. But it should have had somebody with a little bit of an edge. It should have been played with a little rebel you know, I didn't know how to do it. No one, and my father never said anything to me. Uh, he just told me, now look, you got the job, so you be on time, you learn your lines, and no fooling around. That was fine. I mean, I used to hear that from him all the time. That was no big deal. A lot of the actors that were on the picture felt sorry for me because they thought he was going to be too tough on me, but I was used to that. I'd been directed by him all my life. <laughs> That was no problem. Um, so anyway, that that was that was a mistake, and he was so dis, dis, he was so upset by the way that picture. They changed the title, they changed the ending. It was a tragedy. They changed. They took a lot of the flying out of it. The relationship of the pilots. They tried to make it into this love story, and and the picture failed. And my father was said, "I quit." You know, he was so upset with Jack Warner. The last day that my father was at Warner Brothers, he called me, he said, Bill, I want you to go out to the studio with me. I want to get all my stuff out of my office and get the hell out of there. So I went with him. And after we cleaned out his office, we went to the commissary to have lunch. When we had lunch, we came out of the commissary and Jack Warner came up in a studio golf cart. And my father took one look at him and he walked over to him and I was right behind so I could hear him. And Jack Warner goes, hi, Bill. And my father says, I know this is your studio, but if I ever catch you alone in a men's room or anywhere, I'm gonna put you in the hospital for six weeks. And he just stared at him and Jack Warner, 
couldn't, he got in his golf cart and, and left quickly. And that was the last time my father entered Warner Brothers studio. So that was a sad thing and he, he really was hurt for the first time. I mean, he had pictures that were unsuccessful before, but it never, he never let it bother him because he was out making another one. And uh, when his marriages broke up, his answer was, I'll make another picture. And that's what he did. He's asking me how I put together all my father's information, his, his life and everything. Uh, first of all, I was very close to my father. Um, I spent so much, particularly the last four or five years of my father's life, because he wrote, after he quit the business, he didn't retire. He said, I quit. See, he didn't like the way it was going. Because the great, even though he fought with those moguls, he, he respected them because they knew film. And it became a business where uh, conglomerates, you know, business entities were running the studios and it was all falling apart. It wasn't, they, they weren't the factories that they were, the glamour factories, shall we say. So as I started to try to do something to shine a light on his career, I would get more involved in, in the research and uh, it just all kept coming. In fact, after everything that I've done and my new book, which is coming out um, in April, which is a complete biography of his life and times, uh, I still haven't told it all. Uh, there's so much. I, it, the more research I do, the more people I listen to, the more things I find out about his life. I mean, when my father, this is, the, this is the, the honest truth, when my, my father got leukemia and uh, it took him in three months, partly because he wouldn't take any uh, radiation or chemotherapy. When he was told that he had leukemia and I was with him at the hospital at St. John's Hospital, and there were two cancer specialists and, and the, uh, our family doctor. And when they told my father, he said, um, that's funny because one of the specialists, the first thing he said when my father walked in the room, he says, oh, Mr. Wellman, I just want you to know, I love your pictures. I saw the high and the mighty three, four times. My father said, cut the crap. What have I got? <laughs> and so, he said, well, you have leukemia, acute myelogenous leukemia. And my father said, that's cancer, isn't it? Yes, that's cancer. And then the family doctor was a wonderful guy, and he, he came in and said, now, Bill, there's, you know, there's lots of things that can be done. And my father said, how much time have I got? And the family doctor went on, you know, they have radiation, they have, and he says, cut it out, Dick. His name was Dick Miller. How much time have I got? And one of the specialists said, three months. And my father said, okay, I don't want, I don't want to stay in the hospital. I want to go home. I want to die at home. And it's amazing. It was almost three months to the day without any treatment, you know, that he passed away. And as he was lying on his bed the last week, and I, I went in to talk with him, and, and I was having trouble holding it together. I still have trouble holding it together, but <clears throat> I started to lose it, and he said, Bill, don't feel sorry for me. I've lived the life of a hundred men. And I knew he had, you know, I knew he had. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About here at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. I'm Betty Wheaton. I'll see you next time.